Now, in Revelation chapter 20 here, I'm actually going to be focusing on, we're going to get back to this chapter in a little bit, but um, there's a, you know, when I go out soul winning, and I know a lot of people when they go out soul winning, they'll use the last two verses here to explain, you know, that there's, that hell is real and that there's judgment for our sins and that's hell. So like verses 14 and 15, typically I use this almost every time I go out soul winning, it says in death to hell, we're cast in the lake of fire. This is the second death. You just explain that, look, after we die physically one time, there's this second death, right? And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Now, this sermon isn't about soul winning or anything like that, but um, what I'm, what I'm going to preach about tonight is the book of life, the Lamb's book of life, okay? Because what this is saying here, and, and someone might ask you this too, out of soul winning, and um, you know, it says, whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. So obviously it's an important subject. The book of life. Because if your name's not in that book of life, you're going to the lake of fire. And we're going to look at every reference to the book of life, the Lamb's book of life, that I was able to find in the Bible. And um, I actually, we're going to go through this, and, and I want you to pay attention at the context and where it's used. Go ahead and turn, if you would, to Exodus 32. We're going to just kind of step through all the different places in the Bible. We're going to come back to Revelation 20. Turn, if you would, to Exodus 32. But what we're going to do is I want you to pay attention to this. We're going to look at, at, at our names being added to the book of life, our names being removed from the book of life, or are they just being referred to as being there or not being there? So what we're, what, what I want to, what we're going to look at tonight is the addition or subtraction from the book of life. How does your name get put into the book of life? Can it be removed and all this other stuff? So we're going to pay attention to the actual verbiage and, and, and what is... Um, what the Bible actually says about the book of life. And we're going to start with our first reference in Exodus chapter 32. And in Exodus 32, look at verse number 30. It says, And it came to pass on the morrow that Moses said unto the people, Ye have sinned a great sin. And now I will go up unto the Lord. Peradventure I shall make an atonement for your sin. And Moses returned unto the Lord and said, Oh, this people have sinned a great sin and have made them gods of gold. Yet now, if thou wilt forgive their sin, and if not, blot me, I pray thee, out of thy book which thou hast written. And the Lord said unto Moses, Whosoever hath sinned against me, him will I blot out of my book. Now, this isn't a specific mention to the book of life, but um, I think we can infer that that's exactly what he's talking about because he's going, he's, he's entreating God for these people. He's making an intercession and saying, Look, God, you know, forgive them their sin. He's like, and if you won't, then just, just blot me out of your book. So this reference of what he's talking about is his name being removed. And then God answers him and says, him will I blot out of my book. So he's, again, that both references here to his book, to the book of life, are names being removed. Right? That's the first reference we see. It's names being removed. And see, why am I preaching this tonight? Because, see, a lot of people don't understand this. And a lot of people think that, like, the moment you get saved your name gets written in the book of life. And I don't, I don't think that's true, and I'm going to show you why, because we're going to look at every single reference to this, and we're going to see when our name's being added, removed, and everything else like that. So that's kind of the purpose of this. So have that in mind when we're looking at these. The first reference we see here is just people having their names taken out of the book of life. Moses obviously already had his name in there, and he was praying. He said, hey, okay, just blot my name out. If you won't forgive these people, just, just you know, basically just saying, look, God, you know, just take me out of the book of life because I really want you to, to forgive these people that bad. Let's turn to our next reference. It's in Daniel. Daniel chapter 12. Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel. And what we're, I mean, we're going, we're going to every reference. And this is why, see, when we... When we build a doctrine, when we believe a doctrine, when, when um, we got to make sure that it's it's coming from the Bible, and that and that um, you know this is this is the way you study the Bible. You look up all the places. You know, if there's a subject that you want to learn more about, what you do is you just try to find everywhere in the Bible where it talks about that subject. I mean, if you want to learn about anything specific, like we're doing tonight, the Book of Life. Hey, I want to look up. I want to know what the Bible says about the Book of Life. So we're going to look up 
all these references, and that's how we're going to learn about it. So the first reference we see is Moses just saying, hey, take, blot me out of the book of life. So we're in Daniel chapter 12, right before the book of Hosea, and right after the book of Ezekiel is the book of Daniel. It's the last chapter in Daniel, chapter 12. And we're going to start reading in verse number 1. It says, And at that time shall Michael stand, stand up, the great prince, which standeth for the children of thy people, and there shall be a time of trouble, such as never was since there was a nation, even to that same time. And at that time thy people shall be delivered, everyone that shall be found written in the book. And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. So in the book of Daniel, like the last chapters in Daniel is a lot of prophetic, it's just a lot of prophecy. And what we see here, of course, he's talking about the great tribulation and then the rapture. And who he's, who he's saying is going to be delivered, it says everyone that should be found written in the book. So anyone that has their names in the book. Now this is a reference talking about people whose names are already there. It's not an adding to the book. It's not saying that names are being added to it. It's just their names are already there. And in the first instance, names are already there. He's talking about blotting them out, right? The, again, this is, this is the other reference where it's a, it doesn't specifically say it's the book of life, but we can infer it from, from the rest of our, from the context and the rest of our knowledge of this is that that's what it's talking about. And you know what? If you want to say, well, that's not the book of life, then fine. It says no impact on this sermon whatsoever, whether or not we include this. Because the point I'm going to make, it, it lines up exactly with everything else that we're going to see anyways. Um, but let's turn to our next reference. I, and I want you to follow along with all these. Psalm 69. I know we're going a little bit backwards now. I, um, I had my notes out of order, apparently. I wanted to make it so we could just jump right through the Bible in chronological or in, um, in order. But this one's an exception. We're going to return to Psalm 69. And Psalm 69 is a... Is a so it's a psalm that's dead, like a lot, like the vast majority of the psalm is talking about Jesus Christ, and it's very prophetic about Jesus Christ. And we're going to pick up here in verse 20 just to get the whole context of this. Uh, psalm 69, verse 20, the Bible reads, Reproach hath broken my heart, and I am full of heaviness. And I looked for some to take pity, but there was none. And for comforters, but I found none. They gave me also gall for my meat. And in my thirst, they gave me vinegar to drink. So remember when Jesus Christ was up on the cross, they gave him vinegar to drink. This is a prophecy of that happening. This is, you know, when Jesus Christ was on the cross, is a fulfillment of this prophecy. Look at verse 22. Let their table become a snare before them. And that which should have been for their welfare, let it become a trap. Let their eyes be darkened that they see not. And make their loins continually to shake. Pour out thine indignation upon them. And let thy wrathful anger take hold of them. Let their habitation be desolate and let none dwell in their tents. So this is a serious curse on those people that had treated Jesus Christ this way. Look at verse number 26. For they persecute him whom thou hast smitten, and they talk to the grief of those whom thou hast wounded. Add iniquity unto their iniquity, and let them not come into thy righteousness. Look at verse 28. Let them be blotted out of the book of the living, and not be written with the righteous. So again, we see a reference here of people's names being blotted out of the book of the living, right? <clears throat> and that was part of the curse of, of um, you know, these people for, for treating Jesus so bad. saying, look, blot their name out. Don't even, don't even let their name be in the book of life, which is condemning them to, to hell. As we saw in Revelation 20, when we first started off, was that if your name is not in the book of life, you're going to go to the lake of fire. Let's turn to our next reference. Now we're going to go to the New Testament, Philippians chapter 4. Let's turn to Philippians chapter 4. And, and again, I mean, it might it, this is kind of slow getting going here, but um, I really just want you to look because this is how, like I said, mentioned earlier, this is how we study the Bible. We're going to look at it and just see, you know, the, we're trying to figure out the book of life and, and a little bit more information about it. So we're going to go to all the references where it talks about the book of life. So far, we've just seen, basically, names being removed from the book of life. So look at Philippians chapter 4. It's the last chapter in Philippians, just before the book of Colossians. 
Philippians 4, we're going to look at verse number 3. The Bible says, And I entreat thee also, true yoke fellow, help those women which labored with me in the gospel, with Clement also, and with my other fellow laborers, whose names are in the book of life. So this is, he's just referring to saved people, and he says their names are in the book of life, right? doesn't say they just got added there. doesn't say anything about, about being added or removed. It just says their names are there, right? Now let's turn to Revelation. The rest of the references here are going to be coming from the book of Revelation. Let's turn to Revelation chapter 3. Revelation, by far, talks about the book of life more than, more than anywhere else in the Bible. Revelation chapter 3 is our next reference. And look at verse number 5 of Revelation 3. The Bible says, He that overcometh, the same shall be clothed in white raiment, and I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. So again, a reference of names being blotted out, but it's more than that, it's a promise of saying, I will not blot out his name. So he says, I'm not going to remove their names. And this is people, it says, he that overcometh, the same shall be clothed in white raiment. And we know that the Bible says, you know, whosoever overcometh the world, um, but he that hath faith, and it's our faith that, that overcomes the world. There's a great song um, that's based on that doctrine. And in the book of 1 John, it explains that, that, you know, when, when, we're refer, when, you know, when they're referring to overcoming, and it's talking about being saved, it's talking about having faith. So it says here that he that overcometh, the same shall be clothed with white raiment, and I will not blot out his name out of the book of life. Um, so that's talking about a person who's saved. He's saying, I will not blot out the name, which makes sense because we have eternal security. We have everlasting life. And you can see that from many other places in the Bible that once you're saved, you're eternally secure. You're saved forever. You're sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. So that promise is just one more thing. saying, okay, I'm not going to take your name out of the book of life, which is exactly why God wouldn't take Moses' name out of the book of life. He had it. He was eternally secure in his salvation. Look at Revelation chapter 13. Revelation chapter 13, verse number 7. We're going to see our next reference here to the book of life. And it says, and it was in verse number 7 of Revelation 13, and it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. This is talking about the Antichrist. In verse 8, all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. So here we see people's names, they're, just, they're not written in the book of life, right? It just says they're not there. It doesn't, say, it doesn't necessarily say that they were removed, and it doesn't say that they were added. It doesn't say anything about it except that when at this time, it says these people that worship him, it says their names are not written in the book of life. They are not. So they're currently not there, Right? It's all going to make sense in a minute. We've got a couple more references to go. Revelation 20, where we started. At Judgment Day. This is after the millennial reign of Christ. This is when death and hell, you know, all the, the dead are, are brought up. And, and they're going to be facing God. And it says in verse 12, And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. Now here what it's talking about, why well, was talking about what says the books were opened? And then it says another book was opened? The books, I believe it's talking about the books of the Bible. The Holy Bible, the, the books are going to be opened up. Because that's what it says that they were judged out of. It says, and the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books. So the things that are written in the Bible, the commandments, the law, because all those people, they were not trusting in Jesus Christ to be saved. They were dead. They went to hell. So they're going to understand now, why did he get sent to hell? Because they're going to be standing before God, and the books are going to be open, and God's going to judge them out of the books, out of the law of God. They say, okay, well, you did this, you did this, you did this, you did this, and that's why you're there. You have to pay for your sins. They didn't receive the forgiveness of Jesus Christ. And that's why it says another book was open, which is the book of life. So basically, you can look at that and say, okay, yeah, your name's not in this book of life. Okay, well, we're going to open up these books and look at these, and you're going to be judged out of, the, out of the Holy Bible, out of the books of the Bible, out of God's law. And um, so here it's just referring to the, to the book of life, 
And then in verse 15, it says, And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. So again, nothing about adding or subtracting names, just saying that if your name's not there, you're going to the lake of fire, right? Revelation 21, we're almost done. Revelation 21, verse number 26 says, And they shall bring the glory and honor of the nations into it, and there shall in no wise enter into it anything that defileth, neither whatsoever worketh abomination or maketh a lie. It's talking about heaven. But they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. Again, just referring to the people that are going to be going into heaven. It's just those whose names are written in the book of life. Pretty simple, right? So again, it's just referring to names being there. Now, Revelation 22. Right at the end of the Bible, there's the admonition not to tamper with God's word, not to change it. In verse 26, or, I'm sorry, verse 18 of Revelation 22, the Bible says, For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book. If any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. So he's saying, look, if you take away from, from, from the Bible, if you take away from the books of, the pro of this prophecy, he says, I'm going to take away your part out of the book of life. Basically, it's the same as what we've already seen, blotting out your name, right? Your name will just be removed from the book of life. Now, this is important to understand this too because we know, we already know, and I'm not going to go through the mountain of evidence that says that a person, once you put your faith in Christ, you're eternally secure in Christ. You cannot lose your salvation, right? We also know that there's a couple things that a, that a person can do to damn themselves to hell eternally and that, and that they just can't be saved. This is one of those things. He says, if you tamper with the Bible, I'm going to take your name out of the book of life. And here's the thing that's really interesting, though, is that in order for their names to be taken out of the book of life, they had to have been there. They had to have been there to begin with, right? So this is a problem for the people that think that once a person gets saved, then their names get written in the book of life. Because then it wouldn't make sense because then you're going to have people getting saved and then losing their salvation because their names now are being taken out of the book of life. But what I'm going to propose to you, we got, we're going to have one more section that, I'm, that we're going to refer to. And, this, and I'm saving it for last because it's probably the trickiest as far as the wording goes. But I believe that the book of life, we're going to see in the next verse, is from the foundation of the world. It's been around before we ever even were born. The book of life existed, and all the names of everybody have been written into the book of life. Okay? And that your name starts off in the book of life. And the only thing that can happen is for your name to be removed from the book of life. Nobody's names get added. They already start there. And basically what happens is that there are things you can do. Your name can be removed. Maybe... You know, you don't do anything like tampering with the Bible or doing some, you know, some other sin. Of, you know, you don't, you don't become reprobate, but you go through your whole life and you don't receive Christ. And then when you, you know, when you die, if you haven't received Christ, I believe then your name will be blotted out of the book of life. You've lost any opportunity to put your faith in Christ. And at that point, your name becomes removed. And it's important to notice because every single reference that we've looked at, there's one more reference left. Go ahead and turn to Revelation 17 because this is the last, the last reference. We've already looked at all of them. The only thing that we see happening is either names either being there or not being there, just a reference to that, or a name being blotted out or being removed. We see nothing to an addition of names going into the book of life. Now look at Revelation 17. Look at verse number 8. It says, The beast that thou sawest was and is not, and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition. And they that dwell on the earth shall wonder, whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world, when they behold the beast that was and is not, and yet is. Now, I want to take a little bit of time explaining this verse because it can be a little bit tricky because at first glance, it looks very Calvinistic. Because you look at it and say, like, wait, their names are not written in the book of life. 
and they've never been in the book of life from the foundation of the world. That's kind of how it reads when you read it at first glance. But let's look at it and just understand. It doesn't mean that their names were never written in the book of life. First of all, we get the origin of the book of life, as I alluded to earlier, that says, whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world. The book of life is from the foundation of the world. That's, the, that's, the, um, the, that's where the prepositional phrase, from the foundation of the world, is referring to the book of life. That's, the book of life has been ever since the foundation of the world. And then it says, whose names were not written in the book of life. And again, the, um, the verb tense will make you think that like they were never written. But all it's just simply saying is that these people that he just, he just referred to, that, uh, that dwell on the earth, that wonder at the beast, their names were not written in the book at this time that this is going on, but the book of life is from the foundation of the world. And again, it's, it's kind of tricky to, to, to get that, but when you look at all of the other references, it still makes sense when you read it that, that it can read that way. And... Um, we never see the direct reference of people's names being added to the book of life. We only ever see their names being removed or just having already been, been in there. And like I said with Revelation 22, if, um, if your name is added in there after you get saved, then, then how is it going to be removed? Like if it was never there to begin with, how, how is it that you're going to lose your salvation? And um, it's the same thing with this. But um, the idea that everybody's name starts off in the book of life is consistent with a few other things. You know, first of all, the Bible says that God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God wants everybody to be saved. And it, make, it makes perfect sense that everybody's name would start off in the book of life. And here's the other thing. More, even more importantly than that is the fact that, you know, it's your sin that causes you to not be able to get into heaven, right? I mean, if, if theoretically if a person lived a perfect life and never sinned at all, like Jesus Christ did, you would earn, you would basically be able to get, you would deserve to go to heaven. Your sin is what prevents you from getting into heaven. So here's the thing. If the, if the book existed from the foundation of the world, we didn't even, you know, had lived yet in time in order to, um, you know, to commit sin and to get our names removed from the book of life, then um, it makes sense that we all start, that everybody starts off there. And here's the thing is that we know from the Bible, we know for a fact that babies go to heaven when they die. And we're going to look at this a little bit. Um, I, I'm going to prove that to you. Look at 2 Samuel chapter 12. And here's the thing. You'll notice that... Um, the more you learn the Bible, you'll see how doctrines like complement each other, and they, they kind of they're all related in, in some degree. Like just the, the doctrines that you learn are, are will impact other doctrines, and they have to in order for the Bible to be without contradiction, they have to they have to work together. Everything kind of fits together like a puzzle, and it's a perfect puzzle. Like every single piece of the Bible, we know if it's God's word, it's going to be perfect. There's going to be no contradictions whatsoever. And it's, it's beautiful. I mean, the, the perfection of God's word is amazing, the way that everything fits together. But you're also going to notice that when someone believes in a false doctrine, it's usually not just one doctrine that they're screwed up on. Because when you start messing and tampering and tweaking one doctrine, it's going to affect other things too. Now, what we're talking about here with the book of life, this isn't some major doctrine and this isn't some big fight or anything like that. I just thought it was pretty interesting I learned this before, and it's something that's just good to know about, especially when you're using verses out soul winning, and people might ask you and bring up, hey, the book of life, what is that all about? You know, do you want to be able to explain it to them? You can. God doesn't want any of us to perish, and see, it, it works out perfectly with that doctrine, that God's not willing for any of us to perish. He wants us all to be saved. We all start off in the book of life. The same exact thing with, with a, a baby, an infant that's, that dies, they don't go to hell because... They haven't sinned yet. They don't even know what sin is. They don't know right from wrong. If you don't know, if a person doesn't know right from wrong, a, a baby, an infant, a child that's young, like they don't even know any better, how can they be? How can they sin? It's impossible. They don't know the law. The law hasn't entered for them because 
They don't, they don't know it yet. I'm going to prove that to you. But look at first at 2 Samuel, look at chapter number 12. We're going to see here the first proof of a baby going to heaven, a baby being saved. And if you're in 2 Samuel chapter 12, look at verse number 19. This is the story of, of David's child with Bathsheba when, when he committed adultery with Bathsheba and, and she became pregnant and had a child. God was punishing him and that child did not live. So here we look at verse number 19. It says, but when David saw that his servants whispered, David perceived that the child was dead. Therefore, David said unto his servants, is the child dead? And they said, he is dead. Then David arose from the earth and washed and anointed himself and changed his apparel and came into the house of the Lord and worshiped. Then he came to his own house and when he required, they set bread before him and he did eat. Then his servants, then said his servants unto him, what thing is this that thou hast done? Thou didst fast and weep for the child while it was alive. But when the child was dead, thou didst rise and eat bread. So they don't understand this. They're saying, look, because the child was sick. First, the child was stricken and it was real sick. So David's fasting, he's weeping, he's you know, going to God and just, just begging God for mercy to save the child. He's not eating, you know, he's really upset. He finds out the child's dead. You know, he accepts it, he goes, okay, I'm gonna he walk, cleans himself up, washes up, you know, and, and gets some gets some food. He stops his fast, says, okay. So they're they're asking about it, they don't get it. And it says in verse 22, and he said, he answers him, while the child was yet alive, I fasted and wept, for I said, who can tell whether God will be gracious to me that the child may live? He said, there's hope while the child's alive for, you know, for God to do something. And he said, I don't know. I mean, maybe God will listen to me. It says in verse 23, but now he is dead. Wherefore should I fast? Can I bring him back again? And the, the next, the, the, the last part here is, is critical here. It's key. He says, I shall go to him but he shall not return to me. Now, David was saved. If, if, David, if David was, um, you know, if the baby wasn't going to heaven, then David couldn't say, I'm going to go to him, right? How is he going to be with his, with his son, with his child, if, um, you know, with David being saved, if this child wasn't in heaven? And he's basically saying, look, I'm going to go to him, but he's not going to come back to me. You know, once you're dead, you're not, you know, unless there was those rare miracles where, where you know, Jesus brought someone back from the dead or whatever, He's like, he's not coming back to me. But I am going to go to him. He was confident. He said, look, I'm going to go to him. And this is just, this is one proof that, that um, you know, when a baby dies, when an infant dies, they go to heaven. And look at Romans chapter 7, if you would. And see, this is important to learn this because, you know, it might start with some smaller doctrine, something that's, that you might think is not that big of a deal. But then, you know, you get into this... Um, you know, people who don't believe that, um, if you don't believe that, because see, here's the thing. A lot of people believe in this false doctrine of original sin. And it basically teaches that, and, and what I mean by that, this false doctrine, is that people think that because Adam sinned, that his sin was passed to us. Now, we have a sinful nature that was from Adam, but here's the thing, is that we're not held responsible for the sin that Adam committed. So like the moment you're conceived in the womb or the moment that you're, you come out of your mother's womb, it doesn't mean that you're automatically a sinner because Adam sinned. You're not held responsible for other people's sins. God's judgment might get passed upon, um, you know, people might get cursed, it, you know, not eternally, but, but the, the ramifications of sin affect other people. That's a better way of putting it. The ramifications. So like when I go out and sin, it's going to affect other people and they might suffer because of it, but that doesn't make them a sinner because I've sinned. It just means that they're negatively impacted. So Adam's sin, we're not held responsible for what he did. Now the ramifications may come upon us to some degree, but we're not responsible for our, you know, our own soul for what he did. But some people think that hey, there's this original sin that's passed down to us. We're automatically born sinners because of Adam. And that's simply not true. And that's where, you know, these crazy doctrines of people baptizing babies because they think they have to be baptized to be saved. So they try to do it as soon as possible. Hey, this baby's born. They don't want the baby going to limbo or hell or whatever. So like, well, we need to, we need to, to baptize this baby. 
Because there's nothing else you can do. I mean, you can't, you can't wait to hear a profession from a baby. They don't even know how to talk. So what, you know, these people in these false religions, that's why they go and they baptize their babies because they're worried about their soul. They think their soul is going to go to hell unless they do this thing, unless they get them baptized. And you see these doctrines all kind of play one into another. And the more you start getting into this false doctrine, the more you have to change other things because... The Bible has to be consistent. So now you have to, when you start tweaking one and start messing with one doctrine, you have to reconcile that with, with other doctrines. And you have to start making it fit and start making it work. A good example of that is like the people who believe in a pre-trib rapture. Okay, in order for a person to biblically believe and be able to look at all the evidence, and, and you know, I'm not just talking about someone who just doesn't know any better and they just, they've just been taught something their whole life and they just believe it because that's what they've been taught. I'm talking about someone... When you go through the Bible and you start going through it and you start looking at all the references, all the verses, and start showing it out, you're always going to find other false doctrine that they believe in that's linked in because it has to be. There's no other way for them to reconcile different Bible verses. And what I mean by that, one example of that is people who believe that the elect is only referring to Jews. You know, people who are Zionists, people who believe that, that the Jews are some special race. That, that God has just chosen, and they're still chosen, and that, you know, because they're Jews, they're special people, and, you know, certain parts of the Bible are only written to Jews, and, and all this other stuff, because they can't reconcile the portions of Scripture that talk about the, uh, about the rapture, that talk about the tribulation, and, and the elect going through it, without them having to be forced to come up with some other doctrine that just says, well, then in that case, because I, you know, because I believe this doctrine... This can't be referring to just your average saved person. The elect has to only be talking about the children of Israel, or has to be talking about Jews. Another thing that they that they'll, they oftentimes will have to believe in order to accept the preacher of rapture is dispensationalism. You know that that there's different time periods, and maybe people are saved different ways at different times, and that there's different rules for different people living in different ages. It's ridiculous. It's nonsense. They're false doctrines. But see, in order to believe. One false doctrine, you have to start tampering with other stuff. You have to start, start reconciling the Bible because it all has to fit together. People know that. Like, If it doesn't fit together and there's contradictions, then why would you even believe it? So you have to do this. And, and again, I mean, this happens a lot, but you'll notice people who believe one false doctrine is never just one. It's never just one because the, the impact just goes, um, it, it makes a ripple effect and you just have to go out, you have to reconcile it. And it's the same thing even with, with something that's as small as the book of life. Well, when you start thinking about it and you start looking at it, well, it, it totally makes sense that we all start off in the book of life because it makes sense that when, when an infant or a baby dies or when a, baby, a child dies in the mother's womb, that they're going to be in heaven because their names already started off in the book of life. Now, if you turn to Romans chapter 7, Look at verse number 6, because this is going to prove exactly what I'm saying. That you don't start off with that original sin in the sense that you're just condemned to hell because of, because of what Adam did. Romans chapter 7, look at verse number 6, it says, But now we are delivered from the law, that being dead wherein we were held, that we should serve a newness of spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin, but by the law. For I had not known lust, except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. But sin, taking occasion by the commandment, wrought in me all manner of concupiscence. For without the law, sin was dead. For I was alive once. This is a key, verse number nine. For I was alive without the law once. But when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. See, the power of sin is the law. The only reason that sin even has power of, of death and, and the condemnation is because the law is written, which gives it that power. Right? If, there, if there is no law, then there is no sin. Right? And if there is no sin, then, then we're, not, we're not guilty of, of going to heaven. We don't have anything to pay for. We didn't break any laws. We didn't break any rules. But when the law's there, when the commandment comes, then that's when sin becomes apparent. That's when you're, you're responsible for your sin. And that's when, when your soul dies, is when you sin. 
And that's why you need your soul to be born again. Or your spirit. You need your spirit to be born again. Your spirit dies. Your spirit dies with sin. And it's born again when you put your faith in Christ. It was already there the first time. But when, 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 you're, when you commit your first sin, your, your spirit dies. Just like Adam. Uh, God said, In the day that thou eat thereof, thou shalt surely die. And he obviously didn't die physically. But God's word is true. He didn't just make it up. It wasn't just, God wasn't just wrong. God didn't just lie and say, oh, the day that you die, thou shalt surely die. And because Adam didn't physically die, that doesn't mean that, oh, well, what happened, God? I thought you said he was going to die. He did die. He died spiritually. His spirit died in that day. The day that he, he ate of the fruit of the, of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. He was not supposed to do that, and he did die. But it's the, the more important part that died, not his flesh, but his, his spirit. And that's the important part for everybody, is that your spirit is born again. See, when you, when you sin the first time, your spirit dies. But before you sin, you're alive. You're alive once. Your spirit is not dead. And that is the reason why, you know, in Romans 7 proves that. I was alive without the law once. You can never have been alive without the law once if you automatically just had that sin imputed to you and that you were your spirit was always dead, right? I mean, you're not born into this world there's a, as, a, as a baby inside of the womb with a dead spirit. It's a live spirit, and it dies when, when, when you commit sin. And now, do I know exactly what age that is where, where you know, a person understands? No, nobody does, and I, and I don't think it's necessarily the same for everybody. But there comes a time where it's, where it's a, an age of accountability where a person in their growth, they, under, they can understand right and wrong. They can understand what the Bible's saying. They can understand that these are commandments that were given by God and, then, and that they've broken them. Hey, when you can at least understand that concept that they're sin, then that's when you become, you know, when you become a sinner. And I don't know. I mean, God knows exactly when that is for people. I don't know when that is. And, um, but because we don't know, all the more reason to, hey, keep preaching the gospel to kids. I mean, who knows how old they can be or need to be or whatever. I mean, you know, we talk to them. They don't always get it. And I mean, I talk to my little girls. My oldest is four. So it's, even with her, it's just, they don't, they don't seem to comprehend a lot. I mean, they can know when mom and dad have rules for them. But again, I don't know to go as far as to say they even understand sin and the commandments the way it is, the way that you would have to for eternal life. But regardless of that, I mean, there is a point when that happens and when our, when our spirit dies, we of course need it to be born again. But um, I, I, think, I think it's clear enough that without any evidence of anybody's names being added into the book of life, I mean, of all the places we looked at it, you would think that if your name was added in at salvation, that it, it would say something like that. Now, I'm not big on, you know, I don't make doctrines based on what's not in the Bible. But when you look up, like, I didn't count them all, but I mean, there's, there's probably like, I don't know, 12 references to the book of life that we, that we looked at. And all they ever say is just names being removed, names being removed, or names already being there. And we know it's from the foundation of the world. It only makes sense that they that they that everybody's name starts off there. The child, the baby, their names start off there. If they pass away um, before they even know about the commandments and, and and are accountable for their sin, they go to heaven because their name's in the book of life. Their, if their name wasn't in the book of life, if they had to get saved first, then that means they're gonna be cast into the lake of fire. Their name's not in the book of life. But that's not true. I mean, we saw the example with David. We know that that's not true. We know that that, a, that an infant, a child, a baby in the womb, I mean, that wouldn't even be just. God would not be a just God to send a baby that dies in the womb to hell because they didn't believe on Jesus Christ. You know what I mean? Like, that just, that just would not be a God of justice because how could they even sin in the, in the mother's womb? How could they do anything wrong? Um, and they're still even just developing. Their names start off there. It's only, I believe that the only time you, could, you, you even have your name removed is you do something to make yourself go reprobate, reject it. And again, this ties in just fine with the doctrine of, of reprobates and people who are rejected of God. You blaspheme the Holy Ghost, 
You tamper with the word of God. You change, add, and remove things from the word of God. Or you take the mark of the beast. Those are the three things that you can do where God will just, your fate is sealed. You know, and, and, and Romans 1 explains people who just reject God. You know, they knew God. They glorified him not as God and um, became vain in their, in their imaginations and their foolish heart was darkened. And, you know, those people too, as again, it's the same thing. Their name then just gets blotted out of the book of life. He said, okay, your name's no longer there. And then the other time I think that people's names are removed is just if they die without Christ. You breathe your last breath. You know, they had the opportunity. They could have their names just, just secured. But when they, um, when they breathe their last breath, it's, it's blotted out. And um, I don't think there's any other evidence in the Bible to point to the contrary. I think it's all pretty, pretty simple, pretty straightforward. But um, anyways, I thought I found that, that subject real interesting. And hopefully you come away with a couple things. I mean, this is not some real deep thing. It's, it's a pretty simple concept. Um, but just remember that when you want to know about something, the best thing to do is just try to look up every time it's, it's talked about. I mean, that's what else can you do? I mean, you're going to look at every single instance of this and then also compare it with, with other doctrines that you know that have just been proven beyond a shadow of a doubt. I mean, nobody in this room is going to doubt or have any, any question about the eternal security of the believer. I mean, you, we can prove that up one side and down another with, with tons of scripture. So when you look at something that doesn't maybe have quite as much scripture, you have your foundation. You say, you know what? I know this is true. It's been proven. It's been proven beyond a shadow of doubt. There is ample evidence to just, I just have complete faith in that. There's no way that it could be anything else. When you have those core doctrines, those core fundamentals that you believe in, that you know from the Bible, you can use those to help you interpret the rest of the doctrine and say, okay, well, you know, how can someone have their name removed out of the book of life, right? If, um, how can their name even be in the book of life to have it removed if they weren't, you know, if they weren't even saved and they're, and they're going to be damned forever? You know what I mean? It's just kind of a, you can look at it that way of, of to help you even understand this. Or, or anything, whatever it is, whatever doctrine it is, whatever, whatever subject you're interested in, you want to learn more about, use the stuff that you know for sure that just help you to understand it. Because if, if you start thinking about things and they start contradicting what you've already learned in other places in the Bible, then you're probably not getting it. There's something that, you, that you're, you're not seeing about what you're trying to learn about. But, um, and then that, and is anytime you, you come across you know, people who you can see, okay, they're blatantly wrong about this, you should also be careful about what other things are they wrong about. See, a lot of people like going to books and to commentaries and to videos and all kinds of other stuff. And like, they'll even take people like, I know they're wrong about salvation, but they teach this other thing and it sounds pretty good. Okay, first of all, I mean, I'm not going to listen to anybody who's wrong about salvation. They don't have the spirit of God. They don't understand the Bible. They may get things right from time to time. I mean, the Catholic Church gets things right from time to time too. But it doesn't mean that, that that's where I'm going to go to as a source for any type of truth or knowledge. But, okay, let's say someone is saved. You know that they're saved. But, like, they've got some other false doctrines. Be very careful what you're going to learn from that person and, and what you're going to, you know, what you're going to study from what they've done. Because... If you know for sure that they're wrong on something, it's going to creep in somewhere else because everything has to work together and fit together. In order to reconcile different doctrines, you have to, you have to change them in order to get them all to fit. And um, oftentimes when you see people doing all kinds of mental acrobatics to, to prove a point and say, no, no, this is true, like, and, and you have to turn to, to a few different places and they really just have to like, use all kinds of logic and reasoning and just to say, you know, where they're not even using the Bible and just saying, well, you see, this is why. And they take you down this whole rabbit trail. It's probably, it's probably a false doctrine because God did not make his word to confound us. He did not make it, you know, to be difficult for us to understand. If it, anything that is difficult for us to understand, it's our fault. Really, you know, it's not God's. He's made it pretty plain. I know there's a lot of things I've struggled with not being able to understand. And once you understand it, it's just like, oh. Like, that's stupid simple. Like, that's just, it's just blatant. But for whatever reason, you just don't get it, right? So if you have to go and, and start writing all kinds of charts on the wall to be able to just understand some, some truth that, that God has for you, it's 
probably, there's probably something wrong with it. But let's bow right to have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you so much for the Bible. God, I thank you for the book of life and that you love us all and that, that you want everyone to be saved, dear God. So you start off with our names in the book of life. Lord, I also um, thank you that, that once we put our faith in Christ, that w our name is sealed and secured and we could we can never have our names blotted out, dear Lord. I pray that you would please just um, help us to study the Bible more. When we come across something we want to learn about, dear God, help us to just to, to search the scriptures and be able to find the answers to all of our questions by just looking through your word and comparing it to, to, every, to all the scripture that we can find, dear Lord. And it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.